Okay. Okay, just a few words. Can I? Yep, bye. So, hello everyone. I hope you're fine. Uh, this is the eighth meeting of the English for Environment course. Today, our teacher will talk about uh, energy and global warming. I'd like to remind you that you'll find link to uh, sign your attendance for today in the chat. Uh, during the lesson, you can use the chat to communicate. And at the end of the lesson, uh, there will be the possibility to talk and ask questions. Mm. So, um, uh, I remind you just one thing, when you sign your attendance, uh, please use the same mail that you used during uh, the registration. Okay, so thank you very much for your kind attention and... Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Agnese. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. I hope uh, hope everyone is okay. Um, so, today we are going to do two things. We're going to finish the uh, the section on pollution, which I started last time and didn't quite get time to finish. And I'm going to, or we're going to start to have a look at um, energy and uh, climate change. And so, I mean, I think what we will find is that um, the various topics obviously are interconnected with each other, and I think that's one of the um, uh, one of the characteristics of uh, of this, let's say, this material. So. Um, I think you will uh, you'll see that um, because of these interconnections, the the question of what what we can actually do to um, to improve things uh, can become uh, quite uh, quite complicated. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to pick up from where we. Uh, where we got to last time, so we were talking about um, persistent organic pollution, uh, persistent organic pollutants, which are the, the the pops, which are subject to or subject the subject of a global treaty, which was signed in Stock Stockholm way way back in 2004, um, and. The idea is very simple that uh, the these types of pollutants don't respect borders, of course not because they're molecules they are uh, they are um, things in the environment and so of course they will uh, they will move around and according to what they are they may move around in the water they may move move around in the air. And just to give you an example, this is the type of uh, this is the type of movement that we can see. I think in this case it's airborne dust particles, um, and I think most of us certainly in southern Europe will have experienced um, sand from the Sahara on our cars at certain times of the year when there are big sandstorms in North Africa and the dust is light enough to be picked up and transported um, across the Mediterranean, Ocean, uh, Mediterranean Sea and it gets deposited typically when it rains, sometimes when it snows. Um, Sometimes you see photographs of, uh, of brown snow or red snow in the uh, in the Alps, and this is caused by uh, dust dust particles from um, from sandstorms. So it's quite clear that stuff moves around, and because of that, uh, we have to we have to be extremely we have to be extremely careful about the um, the idea of um, chemicals which or molecules which are um, persistent in the environment. So um, this, uh, I think, this is a picture of uh, cesium-137. Yeah, it is uh, cesium-137 um, contamination from uh, Chernobyl, 
which was way way back in the uh, in the 80s 1980s um, obviously this in this case we're talking about radioactivity but you can see how um, with uh, particular sort of with particular wind currents um, we start with a high concentration near the site itself but uh, with the wind currents and uh, rainfall on mountain areas um, you can see how things can uh, uh, things can sort of really quite <coughs> quite easily move across the uh, move across the earth the surface of the earth. Okay, so um, okay, so I'm going to uh, just going to bring in uh, a couple of uh, a couple of examples or an example in particular. Um, so I don't know uh, for those of you who are my age, um, you may <coughs> you may you may remember this um, as a as a teenager as a as a child. Uh, it was reported in the news, and this is a uh, Cervezo, which is a place near Milan, which was involved in an extremely nasty uh, chemical uh, incident uh, back in 1976. Um, the chemical plant itself was making um, it was making ingredients for um, herbicides, so it's making stuff like DB, DDT and stuff like that. Um, but a, a chemical reaction went out of control, um, and more than that, the management didn't respond to it correctly in uh, in. <laughs> In any way, shape, or form, and it caused a major, major disaster. Um, and they're still they're still cleaning this up because the contamination around the plant was such that um, the, uh, uh, the the materials, which was uh, it was dioxins, which were produced during the explosion, um, leaked into uh, into the groundwater, and they contaminated the soil. And it was a big it was a Big, big, big disaster. Um, but I'd just like to I'd just like to sort of bring your attention to um, uh, our modern concept of safety as is a lot more advanced now because you can see this guy hasn't even got gloves on. So uh, this was uh, it was let's say different times. Okay, so. Thinking about um, these chemicals or these molecules which don't know, which know no bounds, let's say, or which are uh, able to move around, uh, one of the best examples are the CFCs, which are um, uh, an important an important group of chemicals which were used which were first synthesized early in the 20th century um, when refrigeration in the home became very common. Um, before that, to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure how people managed to cope, but uh, uh, before refrigeration in the home became uh, common, um, uh, they, people had to rely on other ways of preserving food. Uh, once refrigerators started to become let's say commercially available for uh, use in the home um, they were typically using gases like ammonia as a cooling agent now ammonia is not a particularly um, pleasant thing to be using um, it's also not particularly effective it's not particularly efficient so one of the uh, one of the things which happened in the early 20s and 30s was there was quite a lot of activity to try and find um, molecules which had better properties in terms of being able to efficiently cool uh, and keep cool things in the fridge so um, the chlorofluorocarbons or the hydrochlorofluorocarbons as they're known uh, were born and created and there's a whole there's a whole family there's a big family of them um, and these uh, became they were very successful um, because as far as uh, as far as cooling uh, cooling cycle in the fridge where you are <coughs> 
um, you're compressing and then evaporating so that you uh, you, re you reduce the temperature inside the inside the fridge cavity. Um, the, uh, the, the these gases have have chemical properties or have physical properties which um, make them very su make them very suitable for this. However, um, they were also used in um, aerosols as propellants because this was another um, let's say another growing area and also for making foams now you may think well okay foams what's so big well foams became or have become a very important um, type of type of plastic or type of synthetic material which has which find they find use in all sorts of different uh, different situations, particularly where we need insulation. So CFCs uh, and their cousins, the H, H CFCs, um, became quite uh, quite widespread. But of course, um, at some point um, in the in the 60s and the 70s, um, the the fact that these molecules were having um, a del deleterious effect on the ozone layer started to become more and more evident. Now, the ozone layer, um, let's see if I've got it on the next slide, yeah. Uh, I'll come back to Midgley in a minute. Um, the ozone layer is a layer of ozone gas, which is um, a derivative of oxygen, which is between the troposphere and the stratosphere it's sort of high it's quite high up um, and it's very important for life on earth because it acts as a shield against uh, dangerous ultraviolet radiation um, now you may or may not know uh, but ultraviolet radiation is dangerous because it's it damages tissue it causes mutations in uh, DNA and that can lead to um, uh, that can lead to all sorts of problems including including skin tumors and uh, skin damage so um, the fact that there is the ozone layer present actually helps uh, life let's say uh, it helps life down here on earth um, uh, survive the uh, the constant bombardment by the uh, by the ultraviolet light from the sun, um, but the the problem which started to come out, which started to become apparent in the uh, in the 60s and the 70s when satellite measurements became more let's say um, more common and easier to do. Um, the problem was that it was clear that the ozone layer was uh, was degrading, and in fact, they for a long time we talked about the the hole in the ozone layer, the ozone hole, and this was particularly prevalent in the southern hemisphere, um, over Antarctica and uh, over Australia. So um, this was something which uh, which became uh, became quite a um, quite an important, let's say, scientific challenge to understand what was going on. Now, just a little bit of a little bit of, let's say, science or chemistry here, but I don't really want to um, go too far uh, into the details. But it's simply that the energy, the ultraviolet energy from the sun, ultraviolet energy is um, is higher highly energetic there's a lot of energy in ultraviolet light which is why it is dangerous because it's there's enough energy to make to break bonds and excite molecules and once you start breaking bonds then uh, you get radicals you get uh, excited species which are very reactive so um, in this case, uh, what happens normally, and this is high up in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, um, oxygen, an oxygen molecule breaks into uh, two oxygen atoms, which are very reactive. Um, but the oxygen atom can react with an oxygen molecule to make ozone. This is ozone, so it's actually O3. It's three oxygen atoms joined together. Okay. 
And what happens is that this uh, this process sort of cycles around. Okay, so the uh, the ozone can then um, fall apart. It can react with other things. Um, but the oxygen regenerated then reacts again. So it's a sort of a cycle which under normal conditions is um, is equ is an equilibrium. Okay. So um, what's actually happening here is the energy is being converted into um, it's been converted into molecular motion because these things are flying around at uh, phenomenal speeds. So what happens when you have something like a CFC, uh, a chlorofluorocarbon? Um, basically, the fact that you have chlorines uh, present may, means that you have bonds which are a bit easy to break. And this may this releases uh, chlorine atoms which are very reactive um, and the chlorine is the chlorine atoms which um, interact with the ozone to release the oxygen but then they make this stuff which is a, um, a chlorine oxygen molecule chlorine oxide which is very unstable that falls apart releasing oxygen and releasing the chlorine again and the chlorine can attack another ozone so the point is that having these things having these molecules around um, reduces the amount of ozone so you can imagine that the more you have of this stuff the less you're going to have of this and in fact this is what uh, this is what happens so um, let me just go back two seconds I wanted to introduce this guy who um, is quite a, it's one he's one of those figures no one has ever really heard of him but everybody perhaps should um, because this guy is the chemist who invented CFC's uh, Freon you may have heard of um, but he also invented tetraethyl lead which is the lead component in the uh, in, in petrol Okay, so um, this is a quote from, a, I think it's a, a United Nations report on the atmosphere. Um, it, he was the single organism to have had the most effect on Earth's atmosphere in the history of the planet. So it's one, one person. Um, so anyway, apart from that, so we've got the, the, good ozone, the good ozone is up in the stratosphere and that's protecting us. Um, but we also have bad ozone um, so again it's one of those things where the molecule itself is just the molecule but where it is in the system uh, can be good or it can be uh, not so good so in this case um, ozone may be, may be formed near the earth's surface um, and particularly during um, uh, inefficient combustion processes where you have uh, uh, extra energy and where you have photochemical reactions going on for example in smog um, and this it's the same molecule but in this context it becomes quite uh, quite bad because it's toxic it's irritant and it's um, extremely reactive so um, so when we think again when we think what's the message here the message is that um, the molecule is what it is but it's how and what how how and where it is in the system how it reacts in the system and where it is in the system that means uh, whether it or which determines whether it's going to be um, uh, whether it's going to be um, a problem or not okay okay so moving on from ozone um, I'm going to talk about uh, persistent toxic things now which are persistent pers persistent toxic substances um, which are not the organics but these are perhaps more traditional in the sense that uh, we recognize these and we have recognized these for a long time this is a a picture of a, an abandoned tin mine in Cornwall in uh, in southwest England and 
these these things are these species are typically associated with heavy metal extraction so it's not this guy but we're talking um, lead mercury cadmium chromium amongst others there are um, many many uh, metals are extracted and some of these are side products of um, the extraction of a of, of, a, of something which is more valuable um, but in the end many of these uh, <coughs> many of these things have found uses um, in quite surprising places uh, in quite uh, normal everyday uh, items so this is also something that we have to be uh, we have to be aware of so when we are throwing some things away um, it, it may be that the there's a plastic component and that's what we see principally but within the uh, within the plastic component there may be um, trace uh, trace metals which uh, in sufficient quantities can cause um, um, can cause problems. Now, there's a note here that uh, many <coughs> were used historically in paints and as colouring agents. Um, now, uh, in particular, uh, I mean, this is actually quite a fascinating part of uh, quite a fascinating part of, of history. Um, but in particular, um, lead and um, ars lead, mercury, and arsenic are associated with uh, colouring agents um, such that in the early 1800s arsenic arsenic or arsenic was um, uh, was found to make a compound which is extremely bright green it's a beautiful it's a beautiful beautiful color uh, but it's also extremely toxic it's called the Sheila's green um, and it was used in uh, just about everything. It was even used in food, but of course uh, um, people started having problems. So uh, uh, it was, uh, let's say, um, it wasn't banned, but it's the danger of using these types of compounds started to become more apparent. Okay, so uh, thinking about lead. Well, lead is um, is a metal which has been used since Roman times. Um, in fact, the uh, the symbol PB plumbum is the the Latin name for it. Uh, the Romans, who were excellent um, uh, hydro, hydro hydrological engineers, um, used a lot of lead for tubing for um, uh, for the, the the water delivery in systems in their in their cities, sorry, um, and so lead lead tubing is actually quite uh, is actually quite common. In fact, in English, the name for a person a name for a for a person who fixes pipes is a plumber, and so it's quite clear that it comes from this uh, this uh, this let's say this this Latin root uh, plumbum. Um, over the 20th century, the use of lead piping um, started to, uh, or was, let's say, lead piping was replaced. They started to use a lot, lot less um, in favour of plastic tubing um, and of, uh, steel tubing as well. But steel is not a great, uh, it's not a great uh, thing to make uh, water, water tubes out of. Uh, water pipes out of simply because it uh, it oxidizes, whereas lead uh, lead um, is quite uh, is quite stable. However, we would probably associate lead with petrol because of the um, uh, because of the use of tetraethyl lead in uh, leaded petrol. I think I read something just a few weeks ago. I think it was Algeria, maybe. Or Tunisia, I can't remember. It's one of the two has 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 just banned tetraethyl lead in petrol as a uh, as an anti-knocking agent. Uh, anti-knocking agent basically it 
what it does is it helps the combustion, it helps smooth combustion in the engine. Um, now, the, uh, the problem here is that although many countries, most countries have banned lead in petrol a long time ago, um, the lead has accumulated in the in the environment and if you think about uh, if you think about it it's um it's lead which has accumulated in the air so it will have settled uh it will the uh, it will it will be on surfaces it will be all over the place and um i think this is one of the big problems with this type of uh with this type of uh use it's easy for it to be um, distributed quite uh, widely. Um, lead is associated with, uh, with very serious uh, neurological um, effects uh, including, um, including cognitive impairments. So this is, uh, and lead, lead poisoning is well described from uh, in the medical literature uh, for a long time, since a long time. Okay, another um, another um, element, another metal, which is um, uh, associated with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, toxicity, is mercury. Mercury is very toxic. Uh, mercury salts are toxic, and in English we have this uh, this phrase "as mad as a hatter," which on the surface doesn't really seem to make much 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 sense um, but of course a hatter is a person who makes hats working with felt and it's uh, historically felt making used mercury salts uh, to um, let's say to uh, prepare the material such that it could be used uh, such that it had the property the, the right properties for making hats and so we have the mad hatter who is obviously one of the uh, characters in alice in wonderland um, mercury salts um, are notorious for their again for the neurological disturbances They're, they are extremely toxic um, so Maybe you're not going to use it for making hats anymore, but you certainly, if you have any form of fluorescent light bulb, um, including the compact fluorescent light bulbs, you will have mercury because um, mercury is a vital component f uh, for, these, for this type of lighting because it's easy to excite and it, once it's excited, in other words, you, you switch the you switch the you switch the the light on. Um, the electricity uh, excites the uh, the mercury uh, atoms in the in the, the light bulb, and they transfer their energy to other materials in the light bulb. Um, which ends up giving you the uh, the, the yellow or the uh, or the, the daylight effect. Okay, um, but the problem is that within a inside a uh, even a even a small compact fluorescent light bulb, there is a small amount of mercury, which means that when you have a lot of compact fluorescence or when you have a lot of fluorescent lights, you can actually build up significant quant quantities of mercury this is why these must be disposed of properly um, it's uh, extremely important okay ah yes now this was something I hadn't uh, I hadn't I didn't uh, I didn't know about this until I was doing sort of doing the research for these uh, for these materials um, now I did know about Minamata because it's a uh, it's a famous example of um, an environmental disaster which went ahead over, uh, well here it says over a period of 50, uh, 40 years. Um, Minamata is a, uh, a, an area in Japan where um, it's a fishing community and for many 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 years it was cursed with um, uh, really extremely serious cases of disability and uh, neurological effects in 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 
people in the community and children, uh, cats, dogs, animals in the, the environment. And it was eventually traced to the um, to a chemical company which was releasing mercury waste into the sea. But of course the sea is very important for the Japanese and there were local fishermen who were taking uh, the fish and the shellfish in particular from the local bay which was highly contaminated with uh, mercury. Um, and it would appear that last year Johnny Depp uh, released a film called Minamata which is about the photographer, the American photographer, this guy Eugene Smith who was the first uh, first photographer, a bit like Steve Curry, to bring this uh, this terrible situation to uh, to the attention of the world. And it was just released last year, I suppose, uh, probably because of COVID and what have you. There wasn't much uh, <laughs> there wasn't much said about it, but uh, the situation is uh, the situation. Um, this environmental disaster is um, is described in this in this film. The problem with mercury is that it accumulates. It's that classic uh, example of something which is soluble in fat, and because it's soluble in fat, it accumulates in the uh, in the food chain. So. Um, the higher up you go, the worse it gets. And uh, the, the photographs, uh, there are some actually quite famous photographs. There's one in particular, um, which I'm not going to show here because I don't have the, the rights to show it. But it's also rather disturbing. Um, but I would suggest that you, if you feel like it, go and have a look. Minamata and Eugene Smith. OK, uh, cadmium. Now, cadmium is uh, is also toxic. It's actually just above mercury in the periodic table. Um, and you may or may not have heard of it, but it's quite common in batteries, uh, in batteries which need to last for a long time, maybe lower voltage, but over a long, uh, over a long time. Um, it's also uh, absolutely fundamental to um, electronic components which are sensitive to light so in particular a lot of the uh, a lot of the microelectronics which we use these days will have tiny amounts of cadmium in it in them because of this, these properties um it's also from a historical point of view um it was because it salts and in particular it sulfides uh, according to how you prepare them, can have a range of colours. Um, they they were used in fine paints in as artists' colours, and so anyone who who paints here may well have come across, particularly if you do either watercolour or acrylic, you may well have come across names like cadmium yellow, cadmium red. Um, these are uh, made with relatively small amounts of uh, cadmium. You're not going to get poisoned from a, a tube, <laughs> a tube of paint, unless of course you eat it. But then I think you will have other problems before you get cadmium poisoning. Um, and interestingly enough, they were introduced to substitute the lead and the arsenic salts, which had been used up until the mid 1800s. Um, the thing is that these are these colours are very stable. Whereas um, the older lead and arsenic salts typically were um, uh, were chemically unstable over long periods of time. So that's why you see, for example, um, particularly uh, medieval paintings, uh, frescoes, which were using um, lead salts you may see them uh, to be sort of really quite uh, weird colours and part of that is because in time these colours uh, actually um, changed because they were uh, using unstable salts which um, transformed into more stable forms but with different colours. So uh, this is an example, uh, anyone who likes Matisse, uh, Matisse loved, uh, loved these uh, these 
really bright colours. Um, uh, all of the, uh, the foves were uh, interested in uh, in the opportunities offered by these um, uh, these pigments. Okay, uh, chromium. You will have heard of chromium. You will have it in your house, certainly. Um, you may not have a car like this, but you can see it's it's used for uh, coating steel because it makes steel resistant to corrosion. It's also it can be aesthetically quite uh, quite attractive. Um, chromium is one of those metals which is extremely important industrially. Um, it's used for catalysts of all different types of uh, all different types of chemical processes, um, and it, ha it gets its name, as you can see here, it gets its name from um, a Greek word meaning color, because when it makes compounds, it makes compounds of many many different colors according to uh, according to how many electrons it's got. So. Um, chromium very important, but you you may even be wearing some some chromium, let's say, produced materials if you are wearing anything leather, because uh, leather is a um, it's a widely used uh, material. Of course, it's actually an interesting example of um, recycling because it's uh, it comes from the um, it actually comes from the meat industry. Uh, it's a it's a waste product of the meat industry. But um, in order to make leather on a large scale, um, around about the turn of the 1900s, um, someone discovered that chromium <coughs> could be used for the process of tanning, uh, which is the process of rendering something which is essentially biodegradable which is the the skin of an, of an animal into something which is stable and resistant um, very very important process and although many attempts have been made and still are being made to uh, to find alternatives to chromium um, it's actually it's actually been very, very difficult to find anything which has uh, or which gives results which are comparable, let's say. Um, it's actually a very, very complex process. It's actually a very, uh, com let's say, complex industry in the sense that uh, there's, according to what you're trying to make, you will tr make, you will treat things in different ways. But uh, the bottom line is that the uh, the chromium, at least at the moment, is a fundamental part of um, modern uh, modern leather making. Um, so this is uh, this is chromium. Okay. So um, other types of metals, heavy metals, which are persistent, are associated with uh, nuclear power. So I'm just going to do a quick, uh, a quick say a few words about this. Um, so I think I said last time that one of the uh, one of the aspects of nuclear power after the Second World War was um, the idea of cheap energy. It was clear that society was uh, countries in general. Society were was try was looking forward to the future, and the future required um, energy. And one of the let's say one of the one of the cheap ways of getting this energy was through harnessing the uh, harnessing the. Um, the nuclear chemistry of uh, certain elements in the periodic table. So this was part of the, let's say, looking forward to the future without actually thinking through the consequences, which is quite often what sort of characterizes many aspects of, uh, let's say, technological process in the 20th century, in the early 20th century in, in particular. And it's always something which we should be aware of so when someone comes up with a proposal for um, uh, a new way of doing things or a uh, an alternative to such and such, so 
for example, the use of electric cars uh, rather than uh, rather than petrol cars. Um, it sounds great on the surface, but we have to we always have to ask uh, critically. Well, uh, where is that electricity coming from? Um, where are the materials coming from? And so you dig a little bit deeper, and you find that everything, of course, everything will have a cost. Um, okay, so as far as the atomic, uh, as far as nuclear energy is concerned, um, little, <laughs> little, uh, little thought was given to the problem of the radioactive waste, um, and little thought was given to what would happen if something actually went wrong. Because it was thought that, well, uh, this stuff is so technologically advanced that people won't make mistakes, which of course is absolutely absolute rubbish, because where you have people, you have infinite possibility for uh, screwing things up. So, um, so that while the let's say the safety uh, the safety point um, was basically uh, was basically sort of uh, not taken too seriously uh, the waste problem was just completely ignored uh, it's a problem for someone else so of course if if you ask people about nuclear power um, particularly people of our my generation our generation um, you will find people talking about Chernobyl Fukushima maybe Three Mile Island if uh, if they've been around for a while um, and these are classic examples of um, being unable to control what was actually happening um, and also uh, classic examples of failed safety procedures. Uh, Chernobyl is in particular is um, is quite uh, let's say um, uh, quite striking because it's in the middle of a landmass and it's uh, it was only over only recently that the whole um, well, relatively recently the whole reactor was uh, covered or encased in uh, in a concrete shield. Um, Fukushima, on the other hand, is they're still uh, dealing with how to. Uh, how to how to handle uh, what's happened? Uh, how to handle the uh, the waste which uh, and the the, the radioactive uh, uh, materials which are uh, part of that disaster? Um, okay, so what sort of things are um, what sort of things are, are the problems here? Well, the problem is that the the uranium itself is uh, is radioactive but you get the energy from fission which means the thing falls apart but when the end when the uranium falls apart it doesn't necessarily do it in a nice clean way and you get other radioactive uh, elements produced and in particular um, looking at the time scale here now this is this is the idea of half-life. Uh, you may have heard of half-life. You can apply it to anything, uh, anything which is diminishing in time. But basically, it's saying if I have a kilo, how long does it take for me to have to to get to 500 grams? Okay. And the problem here is if you look at something like iodine 129, it's 15.7 million years. Okay, now this stuff is pretty nasty, so it's going to be hanging around for a long, long time. Uh, technetium, tin, selenium, these are all hundreds of thousands of years. So I think this is the uh, this is one of the one of the big let's say one of the big things about um, uh, nuclear energy. And again, it's it involves people. So um, do you trust? Do you trust people to do the right thing? And where are you going to put this stuff? So I must confess that I get a little bit uh, a little bit nervous when people sort of talk about the the energy situation now, and they talk about uh, the the, the um, nuclear as being the f as being the fuel of the future or the the energy of the future. Um, 
and it's it's true if we're talking fission this is uranium falling apart if we're talking fusion that's putting hydrogens together uh, the two different things but um, the point is the genie is out of the bottle let's say okay so uh, a couple of words about um, a couple of words about land pollution um, which affects I think it's much more than 200 million people um, basically it's uh, there's a whole mixture of stuff here so this is I think we can relate to this relatively easily because this is the stuff which is um, coming from your house into the into the uh, into the landfill and according to where you are some countries are more um, let's say uh, some countries use more landfill than others um, I think Italy is uh, it doesn't do very well with landfill um, simply because there's a lot of resistance to uh, there's a lot of resistance to building um, plant which could uh, which could incinerate uh, incinerate a lot of this material and get energy out of it um, but of course incineration well that leads you into thinking about pollution and are they burning it properly are we going to end up polluting more so uh, you end up with a, a situation of uh, of not really um, not really making decisions um, so looking at the I mean this number is from five years ago so it's uh, it's it's a bit bigger these days um, 2.01 well 2 billion tons 2 billion tons of solid waste is a lot that's a hell of a lot of waste so um, it's clear that this type of situation is absolutely unsustainable and we have examples from back in the past uh, the famous example of Love Canal in the US where um, the uh, there was a place where uh, we had um, different types of industrial waste chemical waste fertilizers um, being dumped in a particular place then the council basically covered it with earth and then started to build houses on it and of course what happened was after 25 years uh, um, <coughs> There was a, there was a, a lot of uh, a lot of trouble with um, uh, with um, illnesses caused by the uh, caused by the the, uh, the waste and uh, high rates of uh, high rates of cancer and uh, uh, it's a, basically another one of those uh, environmental disasters. Okay, so last last two parts of pollution and then we'll uh, we'll move on um, the last two things it's noise and light um, now noise we maybe don't think so much about noise pollution um, basically noise is any excess noise pollution is any excess noise in the environment even uh, when you use headphones you are uh, and you're listening to music um, you are polluting your ears with uh, excess noise in some way um, it's uh, it's a bit of a problem well it's a bit of a problem it's a it's a big problem in cities because it can be uh, it can be low level and it can be constant while of course if you have higher levels of noise this can actually be uh, deleterious and it can cause uh, pain and eventually uh, hearing loss um, one of the one of the challenges for and I think we'll meet this in sustainable cities one of the challenges going forward is to actually have cities which are livable um, uh, not just survivable but livable in the sense that um, the, uh, the the noise levels are under under control um, so just to give you an idea of the the scale of things um, noise is measured on uh, on the decibel scale which is a logarithmic scale 
um, some of these uh, some sounds are um, like the rustling of leaves so that's on a, a nice autumn day and you can just hear the leaves rustling that's about 20 to 30 decibels um, in contrast if you have a, an ambulance goes past or you you're near some thunder thunderstorm you can uh, have quite easily get to decibels uh, decibel levels which are over 120 um, anything over 85 is considered uh, potentially harmful so uh, some so what you can see is you can see some things are natural because a thunderclap a, a thunderstorm uh, is just a, is a natural noise whereas things like sirens of course aren't and the, the problem in cities is that a lot of the noise isn't natural so uh, just things like um, a lawnmower you're cutting the grass now this I don't think this applies to a, a, an electric hover mower but it will be a petrol mower probably uh, subway trains though can be quite loud um, rock concerts of course because there's no <laughs> there's no point in them not being loud um, but it does have a noise will have an effect on 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 people and also on wildlife so um, just to give you some examples here, uh, it's been shown that uh, caterpillar, caterpillars will um, are affected by um, loud noises. So are birds. Um, animals that may be using sound for um, navigation, finding food, attracting mates, avoiding predators, these will all be affected if there are constant levels of loud noise in the background. Okay, so um, if you are, if if for example you're a songbird and attracting a mate requires you to sing, but the mate can't hear the the song because of uh, loud noise or because of constant noise pollution in the background, um, this means that there will be no eggs and there will be no young. So uh, this is something which can impact the uh, survival. Um, now we obviously we don't live in the sea, but noise does actually travel through water, of course. And uh, I think everybody is aware of how uh, cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and the like uh, use um, use noise, use sound to uh, navigate um, essentially biological equivalents of sonar if you like um, but of course people are very active in the on the oceans and under the oceans as well um, and so over time uh, we have uh, managed to uh, pollute the uh, the oceans with um, acoustic pollution so in particular it's the whales and the dolphins which will which suffer uh, suffer from this suffer from this pollution because of the fact that they u they use it not just for f location of food but it's feeding they use it for uh, location of uh, of each other they use it for communication we've, i think we've all heard the um, we've all heard the uh, the recordings of the whale, uh, the whale songs. So, um, because of uh, activity under the sea, and this is drilling, it's uh, sonar which is used for uh, used for location. Um, this can cause these animals quite a lot of problems. And I think every so often we do see examples of uh, whole groups of uh, porpoises and dolphins which run aground. Uh, they they beach because of because they get disoriented. It seems to be that they get disoriented. Um, so uh, this is this can be really quite a quite a problem. Um, and one of the things which is different between the uh, between sound in the air and sound underwater is the uh, distances over which the sound can actually travel. 
So um, here's one example of a, a naval sonar. So the military always have extra extra powerful things, uh, but naval sonar can be an extremely high decibel level, but also travel uh, hundreds of miles because of the the way the frequencies are propagated in um, underwater. Okay, so the last the last let's say little chapter here is about light pollution. Now, I think I think I think we're all sort of quite grateful for the invention of the light, um, uh, but in inventing the artificial light. Um, people have actually upset biology and, and physiology in a major way in the sense that um, not so long ago uh, and really not so long ago like 120 or so years ago 130 years ago um, or you had a candle or you had darkness so um, and this was true for most people so the idea of uh, let's say day and night was actually um, not just a physiological idea, but it's also a very, let's say, uh, significant cultural thing in the sense that um, uh, things stopped at night. And um, part of uh, part of being, let's say, being in the dark um, is one of the nice things is when you're out in the countryside and you can see the stars now if you live in a city of course you're going to see very very few stars and I think it's always it's always interesting to see how people who don't know uh, or who have never really sort of thought about being um, outside under a really dark sky it's always interesting to see how they react to seeing stars and it's like uh, the sense of there's a sense of connecting back to something um, something ancient uh, I'm not trying to be sort of let's say romantic here it's just uh, I think it is it's, it's something that I've seen people uh, uh, I've seen people sort of who normally wouldn't Think about looking up when you are under the street lamp, under the street light. Um, if you take them out to the countryside and they look up and they see the stars that they normally don't see, uh, it can be quite uh, quite eye-opening for them. Um, so, of course, as the mega cities uh, and the there are more people, the urban conurbations are growing. Um, it becomes impossible to um, to make these uh, these connections to uh, um, to the to the night sky. But of course, uh, street lights and uh, lights in the city in general have big effects on animals, and um, many animals are adapted for hunting it to hunting in the dark. Um, and they will have their behavior uh, modified. They will modify their behavior by uh, changes in the light levels. So just an example of the, of the dung beetles, which, um, uh, which orient, orient, take, orient themselves according to the positions of some bright stars, which is quite surprising, actually. These are, these are insects, but they are... Uh, they do uh, orient themselves um, and in a situation where there's too much light of course they can no longer they can no longer do that another example are the other turtles which uh, hatch on beaches now I think there was an example a few weeks ago of turtles hatching in um, uh, in northern Italy um, the furthest north that they've ever been recorded. Okay, so that's uh, it was years ago. Okay, that's that's a, that's another thing. But um, in Florida, for example, the uh, the the hatching uh, time is uh, linked to the moonlight. It's linked to the full moon, 
and one of the problems is that because they, the turtles have an instinct to go towards the light, the light should be the full moon over the sea, but there's always a lot of light inland from the cities and so they go off in the wrong direction. Um, other examples are simply things like uh, moths which, uh, and insects which are um, more visible and they can't effectively um, escape from the, uh, from the bats. So um, as far as light and humans are concerned, um, artificial light is it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Um, it definitely causes people uh, problems with uh, with um, physiology in it, uh, and the circadian rhythm and the melatonin uh, uh, connection to the biological clock. So um, melatonin is something which is a, is a hormone which we produce and which is um, uh, used to induce sleep um, and there's a whole set of positive effects on um, of having the melatonin cycle um, in let's say correct or in the right uh, the right way um, and it helps the functioning of uh, of different or of different organs in the body um, so one of the one of the things here is the fact that by exposing ourselves to artificial light we suppress the production of melatonin which means that we don't uh, our body's not getting the uh, the signal to that tells us that it's time to go to sleep it's time to go to bed um so uh, even uh, even well certainly people are um subject to um, uh, to the effects of light pollution which can be not necessarily just outside in the street but also in your house in the sense that you uh, we have lights on uh, during uh, during the evening so um, okay so just to sum up this whole piece and then I'm going to uh, going to move over to to energy um, so when we think about pollution, um, I mean, I know I certainly tend to think about bad air and bad water, sort of water that has stuff in it that you shouldn't drink, or air which has stuff in it that you don't really want to breathe. But we should also think about um, other types of pollution, amongst which, um, as far as the environment is concerned, certainly light and sound are no less important than uh, than pollution of the uh, air pollution, water pollution, and of course um, uh, polluting uh, polluting the land from um, uh, by throwing away stuff in landfill. So um, I don't know if anyone has any any questions or any comments about this. Um, this so this is the this is the one which is from um, last week, which I should have finished last week, but I wasn't able to. So, any any questions or any comments? <laughs> okay, uh, I just have to change my screen sharing I think just one second okay yeah this should go okay any anybody um, anybody got any anything to say about uh, pollution oops no it's gone on the wrong one why is it gone over there I don't want it to do that I just Two seconds, please. Uh, the, 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 the slideshow. I can just set up slideshow. Uh, okay, right. Okay, uh, which kind of do you think is the most dangerous for the Earth? Ha ha ha! That's a good question, uh, Christina. Um, 
To be honest with you, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know how to answer that because each is uh, each has its own particular, let's say, merits, in the sense that, um, well, okay, if we have bad air, if air, if the air is polluted, we can't breathe. Um, if we have polluted land, the things that we grow and eat, or the the things that we drink. Uh, are going to be, uh, let's say, polluted, but you can imagine that you could clean that up. Um, but I'm just looking at the this comment about nuclear pollution. I think the problem there is it, it's because it lasts such a long time. So um, I think the challenge is to uh, to try and reduce the, the 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 sorts of pollution that you're going to come across in the in the cities so uh, the air pollution and certainly the um, uh, certainly the water pollution because in the end that's stuff that we you can't avoid not breathing you know, you can't you can't hold your breath <laughs> for, for 45 years or ho however long okay so um, I, th I, th I would suggest that air and water pollution are the ones which we should be really, really focusing on. But I definitely would also suggest that um, we need to remember that pollution is more than just bad air and bad water. Okay, uh, and Kamal has just said, I never thought about acoustic pollution. But if you think about it, it is. Uh, and again, we don't think about uh, we don't think about this when we go out into uh, until you go out into nature and you sort of you're listening to the silence. So, okay, okay. So if if everyone's okay, I'm going to I'm going to move on. But uh, please put your I've got the comment section open uh, on another screen so I can see comments as we uh, as we go forward so I'm going to start this today I will definitely not finish it today because there's a lot of stuff here um, and one of the I think one of the things which we'll see even more here is this idea of how things are connected now um, so uh, I'm going to talk about energy and global warming so um, energy heat and power can be a bit confusing um, because we uh, we sometimes use them almost interchangeably um, when perhaps we need to be a little bit more precise but this isn't going to be a, a, a lesson on engineering and physics, so uh, don't <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, but let's just think about uh, a couple of basic things. Um, one of the fundamental principles uh, of, um, of thermodynamics is that you you can't destroy energy; you can only transform it. Uh, you can't create it and you can't uh, you can't destroy it what you can do is you can transform it into something else which is maybe not very useful okay and that's one of the key things in this let's say when we're thinking about energy is this idea of being able to get <clears throat> being able to transform energy efficiently from one form into a form which is useful for us now um, modern civilization you just you just have to look around you and just think about well the fact that we're doing this this is all being powered by electricity um, is clearly based on this uh, this idea of being able to uh, transform uh, energy so I'm using electricity to transform uh, sound to transform light uh, so 
we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of let's say transformations going on. Just think about um, your breakfast. You get on your bike, or you walk to the bus, or you get you climb into your car. Um, that energy from your breakfast is being transformed through your body uh, into various uh, different uh, things such as heat and motion. Okay, so uh, it's worth sort of uh, looking around you to see, um, you know, to, to, to consider uh, energy and how it's... Um, uh, how it gets uh, how it gets changed. Um, in fact, I'm just looking around now, and I've just realised that I I'm in a, I'm in my study, and I have quite a lot of books here. Um, and of course, these books took energy to make, uh, and that energy is now, let's say, crystallised in the in the pages and the ink and the the colours of the uh, of the book. But of course, I could burn them. And get the, get some of that energy back. Okay, so um, remember that materials contain energy, and they contain energy in the bonds, in the chemical bonds, um, and in the the motion of the atoms and the molecules which make them up. Okay, so we get different types of energy. Um, heat is what's classed as low grade energy it's basically heat it is molecular motion or atomic motion um, we have light energy we have um, kinetic energy which is the energy that you get in moving something um, you've got electrical energy which is movement of electrons uh, and transfer of the uh, energy from the electrons um, you've got chemical energy which is Again, associated with electrons, but this is electrons in the bonds in the mo in molecules, and then you have gravitational energy, which of course is based on um, gravitational attraction, where you have, uh, according to the distance between the two objects, you have a greater or lesser force of uh, of attraction, and all of these things are used. All of these uh, elements are used in modern uh, for uh, by people to get the energy which we need for um, uh, modern civilization okay um, so we've got general types of energy kinetic or working energy potential or stored energy um, kinetic as its name suggests is associated with movement so if you think about water flowing downhill and of course we will see ex many examples of this um, it's the you have uh, you have the, the effect of gravity, but you also have the effect of the motion, and it's the effect of the motion that you're using to uh, get the uh, to get the energy to drive your uh, to drive your light uh, your light bulb. Um, as far as potential energy is, co is concerned, one of perhaps the best examples are, uh, or the cleanest examples are, the, is food. It's energy for you. Um, and something like petrol, which is energy for your car or for your, your motorbike. Okay? And of course, when you eat and you metabolize, you um, convert the energy in the food, in the bonds of the molecules, to heat, because you are a... Um, <coughs> uh, you are a... Um, uh, you, you are at a certain temperature and your body will, uh, you are a homo, homo iotherm, so you are maintaining your body temperature, um, but also it could be uh, movement, it could be uh, a sound, okay, um, petrol of course you burn it and you get heat, that's why the engine gets hot, uh, but you also get movement which is what you're actually after, okay, um, power, uh, power is energy over time, so it's the amount of energy which is transferred per unit time. Now, um, in the system, in, in the international system, uh, the, the watt is the unit of power, and it's 
one watt is defined as the transfer of one joule of energy per second. But these numbers are the, the number. Let's say these units are relatively small, particularly when we're talking about uh, the Earth and when we're talking about um, the sorts of numbers that uh, people are using. So. Um, what we tend to use is we tend to see kilowatt hours. Uh, now, kilowatt hours is um, the amount of energy which is, or the amount of kilowatts which is used in an hour. <laughs> okay, um, it can get a, get a little bit confusing, but it's basically if you have a uh, 100 watt light bulb, okay, and you have, let's say, you have 10 100 watt light bulbs, that's a kilowatt, one kilowatt. Um, and you leave it on, leave them on for an hour. That's one kilowatt hour. Okay, uh, it's it's obviously the uh, the number that you typically see on your electricity bill. So it's in a way it's more familiar, uh, probably more familiar than joules and watts on their own. Uh, certainly joules because joules are relatively small. Okay, so. Um, the numbers that we need to be dealing with, though, are not kilo, which is thousands. We need to be talking about mega, which is millions, or tera, which is a thousand millions. This is billions. Okay. So um, what you will see, you will see uh, terawatt hours, for example. Um, are uh, the sorts of numbers that you're going to get when we're looking at the whole uh, the whole Earth system. So these are these are big big numbers. Okay, heat. Uh, I've mentioned, but I just need to underline that heat is energy which is uh, transferred from one body to another. Um, and you, it manifests itself as a difference in temperatures. Uh, difference in temperature. Uh, temperature is just a measure of heat flow. Heat itself is the um, the materials vibrating. Okay. Um, the more heat you give something, the more it vibrates. And uh, this is uh, this is something which is associated with the, the kinetic theory of matter. Um, but you can imagine, well, if you take ice, a piece of ice, and you warm it up, it starts off solid, and at some point it will become liquid. Um, it becomes liquid at zero degrees. And if you keep heating it, eventually it will become a warm liquid, and it will become a hot liquid, and eventually it will boil. And at the point of boiling at uh, 100 degrees, it will actually evaporate, um, and or it will actually it will uh, it will evaporate, um, and it will evaporate completely, and so it becomes a gas, it becomes steam, and at this point there's a lot of uh, a lot of motion. Uh, the molecules in the water of the ice are moving all over the place, um, and so what you've done is you've Basically, you've increased the amount of uh, the amount of motion in the uh, in the in in the molecules. Okay, so this is what heat is. Heat is, mole is molecules and atoms moving. Okay, right. So, give us some idea about how much energy is being used. Uh, how much energy is used uh, across the world? Um, first of all, you will notice that the graph is going from 1965 up, up to 2020-ish, more or less. So this is a period of about 40 odd years, okay? And you can see that the increase is steady. It's really quite. Uh, you could probably put a straight line on this, um, and we've gone from 40,000 terawatt hours back in 1965 up to well we're over 160,000 terawatt hours now okay so that's four times so this is this is really quite a, this is really quite an increase it's uh, increased four times in that period um, and of course this this corresponds to a massive uh, population increase and mass massive, uh, let's say, exploitation of uh, fossil 
fuels in particular. Um, who is using this energy? Now, I'm not so uh, I'm not going to worry about the units here. This is megatons, um, megaton equivalents of carbon, I think. Um, but what we're looking at here is we're looking at how, let's say, the distribution of the energy is uh, um, uh, is how sorry how the energy is distributed across different countries and different areas of the world. Um, I think what we can see is we can see that um, uh, Europe, North America, Latin America uh, have stayed relatively constant. Um, the Pacific and the Africa has grown sort of a bit, but well, so Africa and the Pacific of Africa not so much, but the Pacific has certainly increased compared to 1990. Um, but the uh, the big, let's say, the big change has been in uh, Asia, and this, of course, is associated with China, um, because China is the driving force. And here we've gone; they've gone from uh, they've almost doubled in in this period of about 30 years. So. Um, the let's say the the use of the energy, uh, the consumption of energy has uh, is increasing. Has increased over the last uh, twenty or thirty years, um, but some regions are growing more than others. Okay, so where does this energy actually come from? Um, so this is where we're going to start to look in a little bit more detail about different uh, different sources of energy, but also how to think about the energy because it's uh, it's not as um, it's not as simple as you might imagine. It's actually the energy system is actually quite complex, but historically um, most energy was was from burning solid fuels such as wood, crop waste or charcoal. So this is what we class as traditional biomass. So that's this stuff at the bottom. And you can see it sort of more or less stayed fairly constant. Um, and particularly before 1850, this was all that was basically available. Um, to, between 1850 and 1900, as industrialization really began to accelerate, um, we started to see more use of coal uh, and from 1900 to 1950 we start to see an increase in the use of oil okay but it's only after 1950 that hello um, thank you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so it, it's it's really f in the post-war period that things really sort of take off. So 1950, um, really see an explosion in the use of oil uh, and also the, the, uh, the use of gas and nuclear, which is this red thing here, which is starting to uh, starting to uh, starting to take off. Um, Hydropower is a curious one because uh, this actually, although it was around a long time for a long time, even in mid medieval time, medieval times, um, and the Renaissance, uh, uh, hydro some hydropower was used for um, uh, local industries. Um, it's only with the development of large-scale engineering, so being able to make big dams on big rivers that um, uh, hydro, hydro, hydropower started to become uh, more important. Um, but if you, look at the, the, uh, if you look at the current energy mix, you can quite easily see that um, coal, oil and gas dominate the, uh, dominate the sources of energy. And um, I mean, it, it might it might sound, it might seem quite romantic to have a, an open fire with wood and what have you, and it's sort of going back to the past, but actually um, it's a terribly inefficient way of, uh, of getting energy. 
because one of the key things about modern uh, modern energy systems is that um, you get uh, you get efficiency on on a, on large scale with large scale. Uh, so having uh, having um, everyone having their own fire and burning their own wood is really not a great way to to go. Um, okay, so the the energy mix is uh, is dominated by fossil fuels, um, and the others. Well, we've got uh, nuclear, hydropower, wind, solar, and biofuels, and some other renewables in here. Really account for a relatively small proportion, um, but we'll we'll talk about. We're going to start to sort of uh, see how this uh, how this is playing out because it's clear that this is part of the part of the problem now. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about um, how energy flows in the Earth system and. Um, we're going to see see what we can see what we can say about this. So, um, the Earth obviously receives <coughs> receives its energy from the sun. The sun is a star, and a lot of the energy uh, that Earth that hits the Earth is uh, reflected back into space. So, Earth actually radiates this energy away. It reflects it. Um, it scatters some of this energy, um, but it also absorbs some of this energy. And when we are talking about when we're talking about climate change, this is the bit which is important. That all of these all of these th these phenomena are important, um, but in particular, it's the balance between the energy that's coming in and the energy that's going out. Which is key to the uh, key to the the, the the climate situation. So, um, if we think about um, energy as being something which can only be transformed, um, this energy, where does it go? Uh, the, the energy that does come into the Earth system that does get uh, absorbed. Well, it gets distributed around the planet. It gets distributed around the uh, the whole Earth system, not necessarily in a um, homogeneous way, uh, but it's dissipated. And how it is dissipated into the air and into the water and across the land. Um, are the the factors which uh, impact the impact climate? Okay, so in other words, the energy is coming in and it's getting spread out, and how it's being how it is spread out between the earth, between the land, the sea, and the and the air, um, are what determine the uh, effects on on the on the climate. Okay, now maybe this has come up a little bit small, but um, as far as Earth is concerned, more than 99% of the energy in the Earth system, so if we think about the Earth as a planet, uh, more than 99% of the energy is coming from the Sun. The bit which isn't is geothermal energy, uh, which is caused by uh, the fact that the Earth has a, a, metal, a molten metal core, and this is moving, and there are... Um, uh, there's, radio, there's radioactivity in the rocks, which generates uh, which generates uh, heat, but it's a it's a minimal a minimal amount of energy from um, compared to the energy that's coming from the sun. Um, so the sunlight, uh, about 30% of the solar solar energy is actually uh, reflected, while 70% is uh, is absorbed. Um, how it is it, how is it absorbed? Well, the first thing it hits is the atmosphere, and the atmosphere has molecules. And according to which molecules are in the atmosphere, uh, they will absorb more or less um, thermal energy or heat. Uh, molecules which absorb energy. Well, if you can imagine what happens when you heat 
uh, when you heat a gas, you basically make the molecules move around more. Um, but some of these molecules are able to store the energy better than others. So as they're moving around, some will transfer the energy more easily and some will hold on to it. But the heat is manifested as the fact that they're moving around more. Okay, so one of the molecules which uh, is good at doing this is water, water vapor, uh, and so you have um, thermal energy being stored in water vapor. Um, when solar energy hits the sea, you have evaporation, which is uh, water vapor, and that's also uh, uh, storing uh, latent energy. Um, you have the wind, you have wind currents, um, which also move around because we know that uh, the atmosphere is not fixed, it's not still. We have areas of warm air and cold air and high pressure and low pressure and the, the, the air moves around. Okay, so, um, so we have the, uh, the energy being absorbed by different aspects, different parts of the, uh, of the Earth system. Um, we also have the energy being absorbed by plants, so this is photo photosynthesis, and so some of that energy is turned into, uh, is used to build uh, molecules, to store energy in molecules, the sugars in the plants, the carbohydrates, the cellulose, that is eaten, or they are eaten by uh, different animals, which are eaten by other animals and so you have uh, some of that energy, a very very tiny amount of that energy is actually uh, captured by animals, by life on, uh, uh, life on earth if you like. Um, some of it goes back into the system through, de through decay um, over long long periods of time, this is long long time, uh, uh, time periods some will be converted into fossil fuel um, but of course part of the uh, thing is that humans actually use this uh, but it's not stuff which is being stored today it's energy which was captured by the, by the plants 250 million years ago or 100 million years ago or 50 million years ago so it's energy which has historically captured and has been let's say sitting there and people have worked out how to get the energy back from that very very quickly in short time periods um, in terms of oops in terms of how much energy actually uh, actually hits the earth's surface in one second it's estimated that it's around about 174,000 terawatts, which is a lot. Okay, um, it's the equivalent of about four million tons of oil every second. Which is j these numbers are just so huge; uh, it's difficult to even even imagine what this, uh, what what this looks like. Okay, so thinking about the, the actual flows on the, uh, in the Earth itself, you've got um, energy that's reflected back and this, this becomes an important uh, factor in how much energy is being absorbed because if you're absorbing, you're not reflecting. If you're reflecting, you're not absorbing. And so things which uh, don't absorb, things like white clouds, um, ice, Will have an uh, will have an effect, a particular effect on uh, how much heat is absorbed. Whereas things which are darker, such as the the land or the sea, will have a, an, an opposite effect on um, the energy balance and on being able to on on taking in energy. So, um, in combination with uh, with um, energy being absorbed by uh, the land and the sea and the greenhouse gas, GHG, greenhouse gas molecules. Um, you can imagine that if, the, if this 
delicate, if these delicate equilibria between reflection and absorption, if it goes out of synchronization, it can uh, it can um, cause the temperature to uh, to increase, and it will increase until we reach another equilibrium. Okay, so in other words, uh, where the balance between reflection and absorb absorption is let's say re uh, re-established okay um, so part of the greenhouse gases uh, do occur naturally which is just as well because part of this is about is uh, the, their presence in the atmosphere um, actually historically has left or geologically has left uh, or has helped earth um, maintain a habitable temperature of about uh, 15, an average, world average temperature of 15 degrees over the last few million years. So this is, it does depend on where you take the, the average periods, okay? Um, in the past, Earth, Earth had a, an average temperature which was a lot higher, I think, in the um, uh, in the Cretaceous times it was a lot higher. Uh, but the point is that um, there are greenhouse greenhouse gas molecules which occur naturally. It's just that they they're not necessarily present in large quantities, and they contribute to the let's say the uh, the the so-called Goldilocks Goldilocks temperature of the Earth, which is uh, neither too hot nor too cold. Um, the water cycle is the cycle of um, uh, the cycle of evaporation from the uh, from the ocean surface uh, formation of clouds which are important in reflecting uh, some uh, energy from the sun and then precipitation which of course drives the uh, the formation of the, the Formation of rivers, lakes, etc. You've got rain and snow, which are which fall on high ground and which gradually run off back into the ocean. So this is actually um, a cycle which requires energy because you need energy to evaporate, um, but the energy is given back um, as you condense, as you. Um, as the as you get uh, rain and snow, as you get condensation, the energy will be given back. Um, now, as far as our energy use is concerned, approximately a terawatt of energy is obtained from. Maybe it's a bit more these days, but it's not a phenomenally high number. Um, is obtained from hydropower. So hydroelectric power, and it's typically hydropower is almost always generation of electricity because it can be done directly and very efficiently. Um, so in terms of flows, by interrupting the flow of the, uh, of the water as it returns to the sea, um, you can uh, get energy from uh, from this uh, from this cycle um, a certain amount of uh, the energy from the sun is uh, is used or is let's say turned into um, into ocean currents into energy which drives ocean currents so that's surface the surface heats up but the um, the uh, the depths may be cold, um, but you will have uh, you will have saline, uh, you will have salt um, gradients, and so you get um, you get big uh, conve let's say conveyor belt type uh, currents which uh, w work across uh, across the oceans. Um, and so basically what you're doing is you're taking that energy from the sun and you are distributing it across the uh, across the surface of the of, of the planet but while there are differentials you will always get you will always get movement 
Okay, uh, photosynthesis, a uh, relatively small amount is captured by plants, and it's not because there's not a lot of plants around, it's just that it's, uh, it's a relatively small, uh, compared to the, the overall system, it's a relatively small, um, uh, relatively small number. Um, of course, this is the basis of the, this is the basis of the food chain. Um, and it's uh, without without this process of, of photosynthesis, the uh, life on Earth would be um, very very different, and we certainly wouldn't be here. So, um, so decay uh, completes the cycle, um, and most of the um, although dead plants and animals can become fossil fossil fuels over millions of years, uh, that's not actually what happens to most of the energy. Most of this energy in, uh, so if you just take these examples of these apples, most of the energy in those apples, which is stored in the molecules, in the bonds of the, of the, of the apples, of the components of the apples, will be used by bacteria and molds and microorganisms feeding on each other it's like a it's like a, a food chain well it is a food chain um, and most of that energy will be dissipated into these uh, into these organisms and they themselves will be food for something else um, what does get fossilized um, is a tiny 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 fraction of what was originally there so even though we see uh, huge coal reserves um, those coal reserves represent a a tiny fraction of all of the life that has that lived during that period it's a bit difficult to get your head around because the times and the numbers are just so big um, but it's something which happens over millions and millions of years okay now um, approximately 16 terawatts um, is being used by uh, 16 terawatts of power is being used by humans actually that's not quite true because it must be no it's 160,000 terawatts of power is being used uh, most of it is, is fossil fuel so this is uh, I need to think about that um, other flows there are this flow from uh, nuclear, a uh, nuclear flow which is um, contributes about uh, not, not very much about one, um, uh, one terawatt uh, and this is from elements, heavy elements which are uh, present in the Earth's crust from um, the beginning of the solar system so um, basically all of these things, it's there's a finite number, there's a finite amount of this stuff on the on the on the Earth, um, because it's all what we started with way way back at the at the beginning of the uh, the solar system. Um, there's some geothermal energy, which is uh, plate tectonics, which is um, the uh, the lithosphere moving on the um, on the the mantle. Uh, and we also have some energy from tidal forces, which is the moon, the fact that the moon, this is a gravitational one, um, the moon is, is, orbiting, is orbiting the Earth and causing the oceans to move backwards and forwards, exerting an effect. So, um, so, as I said, the thing here is that um, the system needs to be or should be in balance um, and you will have the temperature that you uh, that you have or that you experience on the earth will be a result of these different forces these different sorry these different flows of energy not forces um, uh, and so the equilibrium is affected by the components here and how those components are affected by actions so for example in our case we are taking um, 
uh, we're taking f fossil fuels and we are burning them at a rate which is much, much greater than the time scale that is needed to actually put them uh, into the ground. Okay, and so the whole thing is uh, is this idea of uh, a balance or of an equilibrium. Now, um, one of the things which I think you start to appreciate when you start to look at this stuff in a bit more detail is that. Um, if we think about the the energy numbers that we've just seen, we're talking terawatts, or in some cases we're talking hundreds of thousands of terawatts, which are it's, it's big numbers, huge numbers. It, it, these are numbers which are difficult to um, dif difficult to contemplate. Um, but at the other end, we may be talking about sea level rises uh, or chain changes in sea level of a couple of meters we may be talking about uh, which is definitely something you can relate to because it's the height of a person um, you may be talking about uh, temperature changes which are uh, a couple of degrees centigrade which doesn't really sound very much um, and one of the key principles here is this idea that small numbers can have big effects um, and this is because this is partly because you have um, you have mechanisms for amplifying the effects of changes in this rather delicate and rather complex uh, rather complex system. So um, if the energy coming to the Earth is always the same, but more energy is being kept in then of course what what's what's going to happen is things are going to uh things are going to heat up and heat is movement and this movement will manifest itself in um try let's say this, the earth system trying to re-equilibrate trying to dissipate the energy and redistribute the energy um but of course uh it's never going to be completely even because you will always have uh, some areas where you have more, some areas where you have less, simply because the Earth is rotating. So some areas are having are, have daytime, some areas have night, and in the daytime you receive more energy. In the nighttime you uh, radiate energy typically. Okay, so one of the effects that we see of this is um, extreme weather. Uh, and there is debate about whether extreme weather is um, associated with climate change. I, mean, I think the uh, I don't know what the debate is, <laughs> simply because it seems that it's uh, it's fairly it's fairly um, let's say um, the connection is fairly straightforward um, because the data tells us now this is from 1980 to about 2020 more or less 2019 so um, this is showing that uh, even though it's sort of fairly recent data it's showing that the there are more and more extreme events happening and I think um, we can think about uh, just what happened in Germany uh, this uh, this summer uh, for example, uh, Germany and Belgium, um, and these are by no means unusual uh, unusual situations. Uh, certainly here in northern Italy, it seems like uh, um, we have uh, we have a we've had a number of extreme let's say extreme storms, um, more violent, more water, more quickly. Same things happened in the UK over the last uh, the last 20 years or so. Um, it seems that there is more. Um, uh, it's you have more stuff happening in a shorter period of time. It's like everything is accelerated in a way. So um, this is a uh, you know, this is a graph which shows. Uh, so, for example, the geophysical. This is earthquakes earthquakes and volcanoes which are part and parcel of the uh, the plate tectonic system um, so this is 
you would expect this to be fairly standard, fairly, uh, fairly, um, let's say, um, fairly regular. Um, but what we what we do see is an increase in uh, so-called extreme meteorological events, and this is the part of the Earth system which is least able to, let's say, contain its uh, its energy because it's mobile. Um, so the atmosphere, the oceans, which are uh, liquid, which are heating up, um, rocks just get hot, but uh, hot air moves and hot water moves so um, you have more um, uh, more movement more energy moving around the system here uh, okay right so I am going to stop here because uh, I just wanted to say a few words about the sun uh, but I'm going to pick this up next time um, it's I've got we've got five minutes for any comments or any questions or any uh, any any anybody want to ask uh, ask anything or make uh, make some statements? So okay. So if you want to put uh, <coughs> if you want to put anything on the chat, that's okay. Um, please. Uh, Uh, okay, that's a, that's a really really good question, Kamal. Um, I would say I could say exactly the same thing for Italy. <laughs> um, although a few years ago there was uh, more investment, um, but I do remember about ten years ago reading an article in the Economist about this, and it's to do with part of it is to do with uh, part of it is politics. Uh, part of it is local politics. Uh, part of it is to do with the supply of silicon, um, which is coming back again into the... We might talk about that in another session. Um, basically, the supply, of, the world supply of silicon is limited in the sense that the silicon that you need for solar cells is the same silicon that you use for computers uh, or chips. In general, okay, uh, and so the because it has to be ultra pure, and the there's only a limited amount of silicon can be made because the the, the factories that make it are, are let's say relatively few and far between, and it's an enormously expensive and wasteful process. So. Um, so the thing about the, the silicon was that at least uh, the situation about 10 years ago was that um, rich countries, which may not have had a lot of sun, uh, like Germany, <laughs> could afford the solar panels, or the UK could afford the solar panels, uh, whereas uh, countries which maybe didn't have quite so much money were, but had a lot of sun were not able to uh, invest in solar. It's completely perverse because it, makes, it would make more sense to invest in uh, solar where solar is good uh, and uh, extremely efficient and maybe other types of energy in uh, other countries where um, maybe uh, there's not so much sun. So that's what I remember, that's what I remember reading uh, about. And I don't, I don't think that the situation with the silicon has changed very much because, in fact, if anything, it's actually got worse because these days um, there is a huge demand for chips a huge demand for chips and uh, all of that Bitcoin stuff is just making it even worse 
So um, anything, if you think about uh, not just computers, telephones, everything, just it seems like everything has chips, televisions, everything has chips in it. In the, okay, talking about balance, think about, uh, yesterday, yeah, 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 we, I was just thinking about that. Uh, Christina um, mentioning, uh, so for example, uh, just a few days ago, we had um, uh, pictures on the news of people being, this is Malpensa Airport, airport, Malpensa Airport in Milan, um, people being rescued from the car park by the fire brigade using boats. They were using boats in the car park. So this is the sort of stuff that we uh, we sometimes, uh, well, we, we seem to be seeing more and more often. So, yeah. I don't know. Anybody got any more? Any other comments or questions? Yeah, there were there was a, a tornado in um, there were tornadoes in uh, towards the south of Milan just uh, yesterday. So uh, this is stuff which is definitely um, definitely um, let's say present. Anybody else? So. Just like to, uh, I just like to thank you for your patience. So I don't, <laughs> I can't imagine what it's like to listen to me for two hours. <laughs> so, but uh, I thank you for your uh, for your immense patience, and I do hope that there are that there's some information here which you find uh, which you find useful. Um, but if I have to say something, uh, doing the research for. Uh, for, you know, for for these sessions, um, it certainly is. Uh, it is quite eye-opening. Uh, can tornadoes be anyhow related? Okay, right, uh, Irina. Um, I'll answer Irina's question. Um, yeah, because tornadoes are uh, extreme uh, wind events in the sense that you have a lot of energy which needs to be. Which, okay, so systems don't like to be high energy okay so if you think about a thunderstorm you get the thunderstorm because you need to discharge the energy between the clouds and the earth okay in that case it's electrical energy in this case it's uh, mechanical energy of the um, and kinetic energy of the of the wind okay and so it needs to the system needs to discharge that energy and so what it's doing, uh, what you get is you get these uh, extremely, let's say, violent uh, pieces of wind, which are uh, wind systems which touch, touch ground. But when they touch ground, that starts the dispersion, uh, dissipation process. But of course, they are so, there's so much energy there that they destroy stuff in the meantime. So every time you're destroying something, you are dissipating energy. Um, so you get tornadoes when you get uh, particular temperature differentials, and so if you you can imagine that um, if you have more energy around, so you have uh, more uh, persistent temperature differentials, you will have more uh, more tornadoes. Yeah, so that's it. They can increase in number. Yeah, that's that's it. So you, so one of the things is that you can see tornadoes in places where you never used to see them, uh, or you see more in places where they're typical. So there is actually a, a whole uh, belt in the U.S. which is called Tornado Alley, and it's famous for its tornadoes. But the problem is that the tornadoes are getting more frequent and they're getting more powerful. Okay, so it's to do with it's to do with dissipating the energy in the system so that the uh, so that the en the energy is uh, is more evenly distributed. Okay, right. I think uh, I think that's a that's a really good question, good good comment. So I'd like to say goodbye. Uh, good evening, everybody, and I hope, uh, I hope you have a good week. Um, and we'll, hopefully, I will see you again next week. Okay, hopefully, maybe, hopefully, I'll have a little bit more energy next week. <laughs>
I need a tornado. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. Take a rest. Take a rest. Okay. okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you all. See you next time, 9th of October. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.